rain. The weather is completely under Father's control. And you know, he can rain down blessings or he can rain down judgment. And what we get is exactly what we deserve. God doesn't play favorites or show favoritism to one of his children over another. He's completely fair. The former and latter rains are an example of rain that's sent in blessing. On a physical level, the rain uh, germinates the seeds that have been plant sown in the, in the ground and produces a plant. Then you have the latter rain that comes along a couple months before harvest time that allows the plant to mature and to go on and produce fruit on its own. On a spiritual level, the same thing happens when you plant seeds. You know, your job, that's it, is planting seeds. From there on, it's up to your heavenly Father. If he chooses to send the former rain, allowing that plant to pop up out of the soil spiritually to accept Christ, then as, as they mature, that latter rain comes along and lets the plant go ahead and produce fruit on its own. The Lord can also send rain in judgment. The flood of Noah's time was sent in judgment. Well, what was it that the children of Israel were doing that was so wrong in, in the time of Noah? They were mixing with the fallen angels, the Nephilim. Only Noah, his wife, his three sons and their wives had not mixed with the fallen angels. They were perfect in their generation is how it reads in Genesis chapter six. That was Satan's plan to destroy or pollute the seed line through which Messiah would come. The seventh plague that the Lord brought upon Egypt was raining down hail on Egypt. Open your Bibles, if you would. We're going to start today in Exodus uh, chapter 9, verse 13. Let's ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day. Exodus chapter 9, verse 13, and it reads, And the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning, and stand before Pharaoh, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. That's what God wanted, was his children to serve him, to obey his commandments. Are you able to serve him? I know many of you are. Verse 14. For I, the Lord speaking, will at this time send all my plagues upon thine land, uh, on thine heart, I should say, and upon thy servants, and upon thy people, that thou mayest know that there is none like me in all the earth. That was the purpose uh, that God had in mind, was for Pharaoh to understand he was the only God. For now I will stretch out my hand, that I may smite thee and thy people with pestilence, and thou shalt be cut off from the earth. A type somewhat there for the lake of fire. Those who go into the lake of fire will be cut off from the earth. And in, every, in very deed for this cause have I raised thee, speaking to Pharaoh, up, for to show in thee my power, and that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. Paul would quote this scripture in Romans chapter 9, verse 17. As yet exaltest thou thyself against my people, that thou wilt not let them go. So far you haven't woken up, Pharaoh. You haven't let my people go, as I'm insisting. Behold, tomorrow about this time I will cause it to rain a very, very grievous hail, such as hath not been in Egypt since the foundation thereof given until now. And that history goes back centuries and centuries and centuries. Number one, it's very rare for it to hail in Egypt at all, but it's getting ready to. And not only is it gonna hail, there's gonna be fire mixed in with the hail. Verse 19, send therefore now and gather thy cattle and all that thou hast in the field, 
For upon every man and beast which shall be found in the field and shall not be brought home, the hail shall come down upon them and they shall die. Now, he's given them a choice there. You can believe what I'm saying and bring your servants and your cattle in or don't believe me and leave them out in the field, in which case they're going to perish for sure. He that feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his cattle flee unto the houses, into their barns where they would be protected from this deadly hailstorm. And he that regarded not the word of the Lord left his servants and his cattle in the field. Just like today, you've got some believers and you've got some unbelievers. And the Lord said unto Moses, stretch forth thine hand toward heaven, that there may be hail in all the land of Egypt upon man and upon beast and upon every herb of the field throughout the land of Egypt. It's going to be total devastation. And Moses stretched forth his rod toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail, and the fire ran along upon the ground, and the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt, this being the seventh of the ten plagues. So there was hail and fire mingled with the hail, very grievous, such as there was none like it in all the land of Egypt since the, it became a nation. And again, that goes back centuries and centuries prior to even this time. And the hail smote throughout all the land of Egypt, all that was in the field, both man and beast. And the hail smote every herb of the field and break every tree of the field. Verse 26 only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, was there no hail. Don't miss that. God can control the weather. He can bring judgment on people that are just a couple miles away from those he's bringing judgment upon. Verse 27. And Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron and said unto them, I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous. And I and my people are wicked. Well, do you think this is true repentance on Pharaoh's part? Hardly. Entreat the Lord, for it is enough that there be no more mighty thunderings and hail, and I will let you go, and ye shall stay no longer. Do you believe him? I know Moses does not. And Moses said unto him, As soon as I am gone out of the city, I will spread abroad my hands unto the Lord, and the thunder shall cease. Neither shall there be any more hail, that thou mayest know how that the earth is the Lord's. It's not Pharaoh's, it's the Lord's. But as for thee and thy servants, I, Moses speaking, know that ye will not yet fear the Lord God. This word fear should be translated revere. Moses is catching on. There have been six previous plagues. Pharaoh still hasn't let the people of Israel go. He's not going to this time either. And the flax and the barley was smitten, for the barley was in the ear. This word ear in the Hebrew is abib, and it's the first month on the Hebrew calendar. And it comes from green ears of corn. And the flax was bold. This is a plant that has a pod or a capsule such as cotton would have a ball on it, and similar to that. But the wheat and the rye were not smitten, for they were not grown up. They were later crops. This rye, notice the spelling is R-I-E in the translation, and it's spelt, S-P-E-L-T, which is wheat with a non-rigid spike, and it has just two uh, light red kernels in each head. Verse 33, and Moses went out of the city from Pharaoh and spread abroad his hands unto the Lord and the thunders and hail ceased and the rain was not poured upon the earth. It stopped. And when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunders were ceased, he sinned yet more and hardened his heart, he and his servants, those servants who survived the hailstorm. And the heart of Pharaoh was hardened 
neither would he let the children of Israel go as the Lord had spoken by Moses. Well, there would be a plague eight, nine, and 10 coming. The 10th, as you know, would be the death of the firstborn of every man and beast in the land of Egypt. Pharaoh would let the children of Israel go. God promised the former rain and the latter rain on those who follow his commandments and love and serve him. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 11, the fifth book of Moses. Deuteronomy 11, we're going to pick it up with verse 10. The Lord speaking. For the land whither thou goest in to possess it is not as the land of Egypt, from whence ye came out, where thou sowedest thy seed and waterest it with thy foot as the garden of herbs. Now, this is a little hard to understand. They had the Nile River in Egypt, of course, and they irrigated the crops from the Nile River. And they had a system of channels of water coming out of the Nile and they would redirect the channels with the foot by kicking a, a block that would slide over and block the channel from one direction and have the water go into another. So that's what this is talking about. Verse 11, but the land whither ye go to possess it is a land of hills and valleys and drinketh water of the rain of heaven. The plants where you're going depend on the rain, not the Nile for water. A land which the Lord thy God careth for, or seeketh in the Hebrew. The eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it from the beginning of the year even unto the end of the year. He'll never leave you, he will never forsake you. Verse 13, as usual, there's a condition. And it shall come to pass, if, there's the condition, if ye shall hearken, this word in the Hebrew is shama, to hear intelligently. If you'll listen intelligently, diligently unto my commandments, which I command you this day, to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. Don't overlook the condition. 14, the promise, I will give you the rain of your land in his due season. The first rain, the former rain, and the latter rain, that thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thine oil. You have to have rain from God to have fruit, for the plants to bear fruit, for there to be wine and oil. The first rain in this part of the world would come uh, between October and January. The latter rain, uh, again, two or three months before harvest time in March or April. But don't ever forget too, not just physically, the former and the latter rain, but spiritually. That's what, when you plant a seed of truth with someone at work or wherever, be careful if you do it at work. You don't want to lose your job uh, over planting seeds. But it's important to take it, that God send that former rain that allows the plant to germinate, the seed to germinate and produce a plant. And then that latter rain allows the plant to go on and produce fruit on its own. Uh, a, a person who can go on and plant seeds of their own. And I will send grass in thy fields for thy cattle, that thou mayest eat and be full. Spiritually, the pasture is the word of God, and that's a pastor's responsibility, preparing the pasture for the flock. Verse 16, take heed or guard to yourselves, that your heart or your mind be not deceived, and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. You know, God will accept little infractions against him. One thing he will not accept is if you worship other gods. As he states in Exodus chapter 34, verse 14, my name is Jealous, and that's with a capital J. And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you, 
and he shut up the heaven, no former rain, no latter rain, that there be no rain, and that the land yield not her fruit, and lest ye perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth you, the promised land. Verse 18, Therefore shall ye lay up these my words in your heart, or in your mind. Let these words soak into your mind and in your soul, and bind them for a sign upon your hand, that they may be for frontlets between your eyes. This is in reference to the phylacteries, as Jesus would call it in, in, in the New Testament. Uh, what they would do is take, there were four sets of scripture, this being one of them. The first was Exodus chapter 13, verses 2 through 10. Exodus chapter 13, verses 11 through 16. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. And here, Deuteronomy 11, 13 through 21. But they were write down these scriptures and they were to keep it in front of their mind. In other words, in their mind and then in their hands to do the work of the Lord. And thou shalt write them upon the doorpost of thine house and upon thy gates. In a place of prominence, keep the word of God in the forefront of your life. And you'll be blessed with the former rain and the latter rain. That your days may be multiplied or increased and the days of your children in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them as the days of heaven upon the earth. For if, here we have another condition, ye shall diligently keep all these commandments which I command you to do them, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and to cleave unto him. The Lord can utilize untimely rain to make a point. Turn with me to the uh, first Samuel chapter 12 as we continue our study today on rain. First Samuel chapter 12. Samuel was a very good man. He was a righteous man. And by rejecting him, as a judge of Israel, Israel was really rejecting God. They, they wanted a man to be their king when God wanted to be their king. Let's pick it up with 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 6. And Samuel said unto the people, It is the Lord that advanced or promoted Moses and Aaron and that brought your fathers up out of the land of Egypt. It wasn't Moses and Aaron that did this on their own. It was the Lord who did it. Now therefore stand still that I may reason with you before the Lord of all thy, the righteous acts of the Lord, which he did to you and to your fathers. You folks need to count your blessings a little bit. You forget. Let me remind you. And he's going to give them a pretty good little history lesson here. When Jacob was come into Egypt and your fathers cried unto the Lord, oppressed, making bricks for Pharaoh, then the Lord sent Moses and Aaron, which brought forth your fathers out of Egypt and made them dwell in this place. And when they forgot the Lord their God, he sold them into the hand of Sisera. Sisera was uh, the captain of Jabin, the king of Canaan's armies captain of the host of Hazor, and into the hand of the Philistines, and into the hand of the king of Moab, Eglon by name. And they fought against them. And it happened, it was a, a cycle that just happened over and over and over. Israel would mess up and not do things God's way. God would send somebody to oppress them, an enemy, uh, such as the Philistine, Sisera, or the king of Moab. And then when the people of Israel had all they could handle, they would cry out to the Lord, deliver us, deliver us. And God would send a judge to do just that. Verse 10. And they cried unto the Lord and said, we have sinned because we have forsaken the Lord and have served Balaam and Ashtaroth. 
but now deliver us out of the hand of our enemies and we will serve thee. That won't last long. And the Lord heard that over and over and again. And he would send someone to deliver them, but it wouldn't be long until they would be back worshiping Baal and Ashtaroth instead of him. And the Lord sent Jerubbabel, that's Gideon, the judge, and Bedan, and Jephthah, another one of the judges, and Samuel, the last judge, and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side, and ye dwelled safe. The word judges in the Hebrew is shofetum. It means to set things right and rule. And that's exactly what the judges did, was to set things right and rule. Verse 12, And when ye saw that Nahash, the king of the children of Ammon, came against you, ye said unto me, Nay, but a king shall reign over us when the Lord your God was your king. God wanted to be their king. But no, Nahash of the Ammonites, this is in chapter 11 of the same book, verses 1 through 4, Nahash came against the people of Jabesh Gilead, Israel. And they came out to him and said, let us make a league with you, a covenant. We'll, we'll serve you. And Nahash said, uh, well, on one condition, that is you let me pluck out the right eye of every single one of you, then we can make a, a covenant and you can serve me. That's when they sent word for someone to deliver them from uh, the, the Nahash. And that was, of course, Saul. Now, therefore, behold the king whom ye have chosen. Here's Saul, look at him. And whom ye have desired. And behold, the Lord hath set a king over you. We had a, a young man named Saul who couldn't find his donkeys. You remember, that's where we pick up the history of Saul. He lost his donkeys and couldn't find them. And if not for Samuel, he wouldn't have found them. If ye will fear the Lord, revere the Lord, and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord. Then shall both ye and also the king that reigneth over you continue following the Lord your God. Only thing that God ever wanted was people to follow his instructions, to, to follow his commandments and to love and serve him. But if, oh here's another condition. You will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord. Then shall the hand of the Lord be against you as it was against your fathers. If God be for us, who can stand against us? If God be against us, who can help us? Now therefore stand and see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. Maybe a sign will get your attention. Is it not wheat harvest today? Usually there would be no rain during the time of wheat harvest, mid-May to mid-June. I will call unto the Lord, and he shall send thunder and rain, that ye may perceive and see that your wickedness is great, which ye have done in the sight of the Lord in asking you a king. The rain sent in judgment a sign to awaken the conscience of the people. So Samuel called unto the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day. And all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel, knowing he was God's spokesman, in other words. You know, prophets aren't the only one that had this power. Antichrist is going to have power to do this same thing, to snap his fingers and make lightning come down from heaven. Be prepared for that, beloved, spiritually and uh, mentally. And all the people said unto Samuel, Pray for thy servants unto the Lord thy God, that we die not. For we have added unto all our sins this evil to ask us a king. Moses and Samuel were the two greatest intercessors other than Jesus Christ, I'll add, and, and, and is referenced in Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 1. Jeremiah said, the Lord speaking through Jeremiah said, If Moses and Samuel stood here before me, my heart would not be turned toward this people, referring to Israel. 20. And Samuel said unto the people, Fear not, 
Ye have done all this wickedness, yet turn not aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. The Lord can cause the rains to cease in judgment. Turn with me to the Minor Prophets, the book of Amos. You got Joel and then you got Hosea. After Hosea, you'll find Amos. Let's do Amos chapter 4. Pick it up with verse 6. And I also have given you cleanness of teeth. This is the Lord speaking. In all your cities and want of bread in all your places. Ye have, yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. Now, cleanness of teeth is usually a good thing. Not so in this case. What it means in this case is hungry. You're not going to have any meat to get stuck between your teeth. You're not going to need a toothpick, in other words. But hunger didn't return them to the Lord. And also, I have withholden the rain from you, the latter and the former. When there were yet three months to the harvest, uh, that was referring to the latter rain. And I caused it to rain upon one city and caused it not to rain upon another city. One piece was rained upon and the piece whereupon it rained not withered. Wherever uh, you are, God can bring the former rain and the latter rain to your life. Other people might be hurting for rain. You know, it says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 45, that it rains on the just and the unjust alike. But don't forget this verse, that God can direct rain wherever he wants it to rain. And if you're doing things his way, you receive the former and the latter rain where your neighbor might not. And again, we get exactly what we deserve. He's totally fair. So two or three cities wandered unto one city to drink water. The cities that didn't get rain are thirsty. They're looking for water. But they were not satisfied. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. Hunger didn't drive you back to me. Thirst didn't drive you back to me. And of course, Amos chapter 8 verse 11 should come to mind. The famine of the end time is not for bread or water. It's for hearing the word of the Lord. The famine is on. Verse 9. I have smitten you with blasting and mildew. Both destroy crops completely. When your gardens and your vineyards and your fig trees and your olive trees increased. The palmer worm. This is the gnar of the locust uh, cycle, devoured them, yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. You know, some people go through life and there's just no getting ahead. They, they live paycheck to paycheck. There's always something going wrong. The car breaks down. Uh, the kids need to borrow money because uh, they lost uh, their job, etc. Never get ahead. I have sent among you the pestilence after the manner of Egypt. Look at history, the ten plagues. Your young men have I slain with the sword and have taken away your horses. And I have made the stink of your camps to come up unto your nostrils. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. All these things and you still won't turn to me. I, the Lord speaking, have overthrown some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and ye were as a firebrand plucked out of the burning. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. God can make your life difficult. God can make your life easier. And you know, when we talk about the former and latter rain, you know, and you, I know all of you aren't farmers. But what this is saying is, is that God will bless you whatever your labors are for. I don't care if you are an accountant or, or a professional of some type. The Lord can make it where you get the best jobs if you're a contractor. And, and he, he takes care of his own. He can make life easy. He can make life difficult. 
Therefore thus will I do unto thee, O Israel. And because I will do this unto thee, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. He's coming. Are you ready to meet the Lord? The accounts are going to be settled. He tells us that over and over through his word. I hope you're ready to settle the account. For lo, he that formeth the mountains and createth the wind, the ruach in the Hebrew, and declareth unto man what is his thought, that maketh the morning darkness, and treadeth upon the high places of the earth. The Lord, the God of hosts, is his name. He's the creator. Love and serve him. In conclusion, turn with me to James, the half-brother of Jesus. James 5. James tells us about the former and the latter reign as well. Just after the book of Hebrews, you got a five-chapter book entitled James. We're going to chapter 5, verse 7. And it reads, <clears throat> Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman, the farmers, waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it until he received the early and the latter rain. Be patient. And I know that's tough. Patience is probably not one of the greater characteristics of God's elect. Compassion, on the other hand, is a characteristic of God's elect. But God is patient with us. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. He's long-suffering. That, that means he's... He's, he's patient, not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. Verse 8. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. You set your mind fast that he is coming. Not, don't be a, like a reed blown in the rain, the, the wind, first by this doctrine and then by that doctrine. Verse 9, grudge not one against another. Don't murmur is what this is saying. Brethren, lest ye be condemned, behold, the judge standeth before the door. Verse 10, take my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. The prophets had it tough. It, it was rough, but God never let them down. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Job chapter 42, verse 10. Job didn't take, God didn't take anything away from Job. He gave him double what he had before Satan started messing with him. But above all things, my brethren, this is the most important Swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea and your nay be nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. Don't, don't be one who rides the fence on issues. You know, there's a right and there's a wrong. Today, all too many people try and turn things upside down. They take what is wrong, homosexuality, and say it's right. They take what's right, God's word, and say it's wrong. It's full of mistakes. You, you can't depend on something that's full of mistakes. They want to take God out of our vocabulary. They want to take him out of our schools. Don't be a rider of the fence. The Laodiceans, one of the seven churches in Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, what did Jesus have fault with them? He said, you're neither hot nor cold. You, you like to say there's a gray area. There's not a right and a wrong. Jesus said, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Verse 13. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Always turn to God. Whether things are going rough in your life or they're going good, turn to your father. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church 
and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Don't ever forget the in the name of the Lord. The anointing oil won't do any good unless you do it in the name of the Lord. Every Christian should have olive oil for anointing. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Verse 16, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Bullinger translates this, availeth is, is, is strong for much. Elias, that's Elijah, was a man subject to like passions as we are. He, he was a man, a, a human in the flesh. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. The godless king Ahab and his wife Jezebel were Baal worshipers. And they, they caused Israel to fall away into idolatry. Three and a half years, Elijah called for it not to rain, not one drop, not even a heavy dew. And that came to pass. They, they were in a world of hurt, Israel was, at the end of three and a half years. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. You know, the two witnesses are going to have the same power. Revelation chapter 11, verse 6. They'll have the power to cause it to rain or to shut the heavens up. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, uh, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death. And we're talking the second death, the death of the soul, and shall hide a multitude of sins. Your heavenly father is able to rain down blessings on you, or he can rain down judgment upon you. And again, what we get is exactly what we deserve. He doesn't show favorites. Uh, he doesn't, he's not uh, showing favor to one over another of his children. So uh, always remember, and if you're not getting any rain in your life, blessings I'm talking about, might be time to do a little uh, self-analysis. Consider your ways. Let's go to his throne. Yahweh Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for your word that tells us how to receive that former rain and the latter rain, Father, to receive your blessings as well. Let everything that we do the rest of this day be the honor and glory of your name, Father. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. A day, a month, a year. Uh, what's, what is 700 times? Well, you're thinking, I'm sure, of Matthew uh, chapter 18, verse 21 and 22, where Peter asked Jesus, if my brother sins against me, how many times should I forgive him? Seven. And Jesus responded, not seven, but seven times 70, which is 490 times. It doesn't give a uh, specified period of time I take that to mean daily as long as the brother repents. That's how many times God will forgive you daily if you repent. Question, <clears throat> how am I to meet my Old Testament heroes in heaven, David, Moses, Aaron, etc., when they knew not the saving grace 
of Yeshua. Well, they did have a chance to uh, accept the saving grace of Yeshua. You see, when Christ was crucified, and as soon as he gave up the spirit, he, he rent that veil from top to bottom. But he also went to, uh, you can read about this in uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18, 19, and 20. It states there that Jesus went to the prisoners. You see, it would not have been fair for God to judge all of those who had died before the price was paid on the cross, those who lived under the dispensation of the law, with those who lived in the dispensation of grace, which is after the price had been paid on the cross. So Jesus went to them, he preached the gospel, the good news, and in 1 Peter chapter 4 it states that many uh, received uh, his grace and truth. Kadaja, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Kadaja in Georgia. Uh, Mr. Murray, my name is Kadaja and I'm 12 years old and I live in Georgia. My grandmother loves to watch your show and I wrote this letter to ask and tell you that I have sinned a lot of times, like telling lies and talking back to my grandmother. I wanted to know if I have sinned a lot and I do sometimes ask God for forgiveness, will I still have an open gate to heaven? Well, Kadaya, we all fall short and we all sin. You see, that's the beauty of Christianity, is forgiveness. Uh, you can repent and you're forgiven. So yes, the gate of heaven will be open if you truly repent. And what is repentance? It's a, a change of heart. You don't want to do wrong anymore. You want to do what's right and pleasing to your heavenly Father and you should always want to do what's right and pleasing to your grandmother as well. So when you uh, talk back to your grandma or you lie to your grandma, don't forget to, to, to repent with her as well. And that means asking her for forgiveness. It's a little tell her that you love her helps a lot too. Gail in Texas, please explain Matthew 24, 20. Well, the subject in Matthew 24 you have to consider, first of all, is what events are going to come to pass before Jesus returns. Uh, in, in the abomination of desolation mentioned in verse 15 of that chapter 24 is the Antichrist being present in Jerusalem. Verse 20, which you asked to be explained, says pray that your flight uh, be not in winter, that means that you would be harvested out of season because you don't harvest in the winter. It also says pray that your flight be not on the Sabbath day. And what did he also instruct them to do? He said flee Judea to the mountains. And if it were on the Sabbath day, you would be limited in that period of time as to far how far you could travel. On the Sabbath day, you weren't allowed to travel very far at all. That's what verse 20 of Matthew 24 is talking about. <clears throat> Mike in Texas, when or do you now have a counseling line? I've heard how big your ministry is becoming. Well, the ministry is growing for sure. Uh, we do not offer a counseling line. You know, there are a lot of good things uh, a ministry can do. Uh, but sometimes I've seen ministries uh, try to do too much good and as a result they lose focus and they get going in more directions than what they can handle. So we've come to the conclusion here at Shepherd's Chapel we're going to do one thing and try to do it as well as we possibly can. What we do here is teach the Word of God and that in itself can be a counsel if you will allow it. Allow God to be your counsel. Joan in Connecticut, if there are only 7,000 elect, what happens to the rest of us? Well, actually there are 144,000 elect as mentioned in Revelation chapter 7 verse 4. But 
Um, the elect have a destiny. They're going to be delivered up. Are they special? No, they're not special, but they served God in a very special way in the first earth age. They didn't bail out on God and go with Satan when one-third of God's children did bail on him. So uh, what is their destiny? It's to be delivered up uh, and testify with the Holy Spirit speaking through them against the Antichrist and for Christ. Uh, all others have free will um, except Jesus and be saved. You know, there, are, there are literally millions, billions of, of angels that will be in heaven, not limited to 144,000 of God's elect. Now, they will have a special place there. They're the Zadok of Ezekiel chapter 44. Leon from Alabama, I have a question. Where do I read in the Bible about the first earth age and the second and about the millennium so I can get a better understanding of what our Father in heaven is saying to us? Okay, well, uh, Genesis chapter 1 through chapter 6 covers a lot concerning the three world ages. Um, I would recommend that you order the first six chapters of Genesis CD, three CD set 30146, also 30506, one CD covering the three world ages. Uh, Second Peter chapter 3, the first seven verses go into the world ages. Uh, millennium, most places that speak of the Lord's day in the Bible are talking about the thousand year period of the millennium. Well, how come they would call it the Lord's day if we're talking about a thousand year period? Uh, Second Peter chapter three, verse eight, one day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Order 30550 entitled Millennium for a study on that. Dennis in Arizona, the question I have is, any, is there anywhere in the Bible that it says dancing is a sin? No, quite to the contrary. Uh, the women of Israel danced uh, when there was a victory. Uh, in the Song of Moses, uh, in Exodus chapter 15, verse 20. Now, there are more than one Song of Moses, be aware. The, the Song of Moses most often referred to is in Deuteronomy chapter 32. But Moses also sang a song when the Lord parted the Red Sea, and after that, and Israel walked over on dry land, and then the sea came crashing back down on the, Isra the armies of Pharaoh. But, and that's Exodus chapter 15, verse 20, and it states there that Miriam, uh, the sister of, of Moses, who was a prophetess as well, and the women of Israel danced uh, to celebrate the Lord parting the Red Sea. Mary Ellen in Tennessee, what is sanctification? Okay, good question. Uh, sanctify in the Hebrew language is Kadesh, and it means to be or to make clean. Uh, it has been translated in the King James Version Bible to consecrate or dedicate to the Lord's use. In other words, uh, vessels and furniture in the sanctuary were sanctified. They were set apart to be used only in the worship of the Lord. Doris in Texas, inside, or I guess you mean on the DVD, Glastonbury, it said King Arthur was the tenth descendant of Joseph of Arimathea. How is this proven if Joseph of Arimathea was not known to be married? Okay. And, but you have to understand, Doris, the traditions of Glastonbury is not a biblical account of Jesus' years where he disappeared from the Bible from the ages of 12 and then when his ministry started at the age of 30. Uh, what the traditions of Glastonbury is is a, 
an historical account. It was written by an expert, I believe, in biblical archaeology, a gentleman by the name of E. Raymond Capp. So don't look to prove an historical document in, in the Bible. I mean, that's just not going to happen. Uh, Alfred in Minnesota, where will we go for the seven days of cleansing before we can go back to Christ in the Millennial Temple? And what uh, Alfred is talking about is in Ezekiel 44, verses 25 and 26, it states that the Zadok will be allowed to go to an immediate family member, at, this is in the Millennial period, and try to help one of their immediate family members who didn't make the cut of the first resurrection. But there's a penalty, and that is that they won't be allowed to return to the Millennial Temple in the presence of Christ for seven days. It's question, where will they go? Anywhere but the Millennial Temple. Allen in South Carolina, do you think what is going on in Europe with Brexit is a type of the one world system that is soon to be. Watch, watchman, watch. Carl in Oklahoma, when the person hung on the cross next to Jesus was told by Jesus, I will see you in paradise, who forgave him of his sins? Jesus, of course. And you know, the, the scribes and Pharisees went bananas several occasions when Jesus would forgive people of their sins. They thought only God was able to uh, forgive them of their sins. Well, what did they say to name him? Uh, Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14, a virgin will conceive. That was Mary, the mother of Jesus. And you will name his name Emmanuel. She'll have a son and you'll name him Emmanuel. What is Emmanuel? If you translate it, God with us. His name is also Yeshua, which means, if you translate it, Yahweh's Savior. Uh, I'll also give you John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. That's logos in the Greek. That's Jesus. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John chapter 14, verse 7. Uh, Peter said, let us see God. And Jesus said to him, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Elaine in Missouri, did Samson go to heaven even when he killed all the Philistines? Everyone goes to heaven, dear. Um, there are two sides of the gulf. You can go to the wrong side or the right side. But you're acting like killing the 3,000 Philistines that he killed was a bad thing. It wasn't a bad thing. The Philistines were oppressing the people of Israel, God's chosen people. Uh, it was a very noble, uh, courageous thing that Samson did that took his own life when he pushed those two pillars out and the 3,000 Philistines being killed. He killed more Philistines in his last act than all the other acts of his life. Killing the enemy that is oppressing your people is not a sin. Uh, killing in war is much different than lie and wait premeditated murder. There's a big difference between uh, killing in war and premeditated murder. Janet in Florida. Thank you for your kind words. Uh, my question, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, the dead in Christ. Is Paul talking about those who commit apostasy? No, he's talking about those who died believing in Christ. That's, that's what the verse, the subject of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is. Back up to verse 13 and Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant about where those who are asleep, where those who are dead. To be dead in Christ means that you, you believed in Christ when you passed away. And then he go on, then we which are alive and remain, is Paul talking about God's elect, those with the seal of truth. He's talking about all who are still in the flesh uh, on earth when Jesus returns. 
and we'll meet him in the air in spirit bodies. Why? Because there is no more flesh when he returns. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52, in the twinkling of an eye. Virginia and Louisiana, what will our new body look like in heaven? Is there scripture? Well, we'll look much like we do now. Uh, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, God said to the angels, let us make man in our image. Uh, we look a lot in spiritual bodies like we look now because we were created in their image. Linda in New York, please explain Matthew 16, verse 19. The words of Jesus, and he states, I will give unto the, the keys to the kingdom of heaven. That's the same key as the key of David listed in Revelation, mentioned in Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. The key that opens that no man shuts and shuts that no man can open. It's the key that opens these scriptures to your understanding. Sharon in Pennsylvania, what is the Holy Grail? The Holy Grail is not biblical. Uh, it is therefore of the traditions of men and should be treated as such. Stick with God's word, not the words of men. Out of time, I want you all to know that I love you a great deal. Why? Because you enjoy studying God's word in depth. And you know what? It makes your father's day when he looks down and he sees you with the letter he wrote to you, the Bible, open before you and you're studying it, trying to figure out what it is that makes him happy, what is pleasing to him. It makes his day. Blessings will always follow. Beloved, we are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to your brothers and sisters who are lost in this world of darkness. Most important this, you stay in his word every day. Every day in his word is a good day. Do you know why? Because Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you.